want to welcome everybody here in our seventh webinar about technologies, food and migration, new frontiers. We are very pleased to welcome you. As you might know, these webinars are part of our pre-conference process of the Metropolis Conference, which will take place in Berlin in two months time in September. And our webinars are organized together with the members of our working groups. We have two working groups. The networking unit is organizing. One working group is on climate change and migration, and the other working group is on tech new technologies, migration, and the future of work. And this webinar is part of the working group on technologies and um, the future of work, migration. And today we speak about an emerging topic. So the idea of the webinars really is to discuss emerging topics and to explore also new research horizons. So it's all fresh thought you see here. And we normally invite scholars we find across the globe working on those topics. And today, exactly, we look on the world of food, food industry. And I hope, yeah, please let me share my thoughts. It's now you can see that. What do we speak about? We see that the food industry or the food crisis is in the center of attention since a few weeks. And we see that certain groups are especially um, vulnerable to the food crisis. We see a food crisis since many years in many parts of the world, meaning there's a lack of uh, food, but there's also malnutrition. And we see now additional drivers of the food crisis, which are the impact of the Ukrainian war, leading to even more fragile supply change in the food sector. And we see strongly now the impact of climate change, droughts, floodings, heavy rainfall, changing rainfall patterns. And all these um, drivers are especially um, impacting on vulnerable groups, such as internally displaced People And here I take the numbers out of the global report on food crisis, which was out 10 days ago. So internal displacement is, for example, especially a topic in, the, in Syria, in Afghanistan, in the Democratic Republic of Congo, Ethiopia, Ethiopia and Sudan. And we have, on the other hand, refugees and asylum seekers, which are especially hit by the food crisis in Uganda, in Pakistan, Lebanon, and Sudan. So on one hand, we see that the, the needy people are often migrants and refugees, and there has been set up an infrastructure and technology to take care, which caters to the needy people, so brings food to the many people on one hand. And this is mostly true for the global south. You can see that here. This is also the global report on food crisis. Welthungerhilfe had same had the same um, picture when it came out, the report came out five days ago. So on one hand, we have the supply, the catering for the needy people, speaking globally. On the other hand, the food industry is even more specializing it gets into our attention because it's so sophisticated for the richer parts of the world, the Western world, for example. And there we see changes in infrastructures organizing the food for the rich world and food chains, with chains which are changing. Cities start to organize platforms and infrastructures based on food. And an example here is the Chita del Chibo, for example. So the food industry is in the center of our attention. And we know that migrants often process food as seasonal workers, for example. You can see here tomato pickers, or you see strawberry pickers and all sorts of berry pickers all over the world where migrant work, seasonal work is important and is one part of the food supply chain. We see massive changes with the climate crisis also. So you see here a glass house. So migrant workers in glass houses and in horticultures are important. So what is the role of migrant work, work in the food chain? And here you see that new methods of harvesting, for example, have become important. We have new issues on of food security and all this drove us to bring together 
colleagues to speak in this webinar about the food industry, the food sector, the food crisis. And I want to introduce you to our speakers today. We have as a, as a first speaker, Mrs. Karen Astrid Siegmann. She's at Erasmus University in Rotterdam. She's an associate professor at the International Institute for Social, Social Studies. And she recently came up with a report called Working Like Machines on the effects effects of technological change on migrant labor in the Dutch horticulture. And I just quote uh, a quote from her work here, which says, I thought that was exciting. She said, the Netherlands have many cheap people. And that's an expert speaking. The Netherlands have many cheap people to work, mostly migrants. If you go to the supermarket, you get two cucumbers for the price of one. That's not possible. Somebody pays the price for this. So we need to think much more about such, those questions. Our next speaker is Dr. Giorgio Perina, and he's at Ca Foscari University of Venezia, of Venice. He's a postdoc, and he's specializing in philosophy. And on the Città del Cibo, he will speak about the infrastructures, cities set up. We then have René Osterwegel, he's at the University of Wageningen, and he's at the Food and Bio-Based Research. He's an engineer and he will speak about food security and aspects which become increasingly important. And then we have Mrs. Uh, Tesselte de Lange, she's a professor at the Faculty of Law at Radboud University in Nijmegen. She's a professor of European Migration Law, and I'm extremely happy to welcome all of you. Um, how do we do this? We, as always in our webinars, we have around one hour and each speaker will speak for about uh, 10 minutes about his or her case. And then we have a commenter, which in that case is Tesla de Lange, for about five to seven minutes. And then we hope that we will we'll still have time for a question and answers and discussion session here. What are the social political implications of this form of labor organization in the food sector? Again, I'm very happy to welcome all of you here and I give the floor. I hand over to my colleague, Karen Siegmann. Karen, please go ahead. Thank yeah, you. Thank, you. thank you very much, Felicitas, for this kind introduction. Um, without further ado, I'll share my slides. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Felicita has already introduced the title of our study that's working like machines, effects of technological change on migrant labor in Dutch horticulture. Very pleased that I have this possibility to share some of our results in a nutshell. Um, it's basically based on research that I did together with Peter Ivošević and Orne Fischer, uh, whom I'd like to um, sort of thank uh, at this moment, they couldn't join the, the webinar, unfortunately. But before moving into uh, the case of contemporary Dutch horticulture and the role of migrant labor and how it intersects with technological changes, I wanted to remind us of some of the histories of that triangle between technology, food and migration. And that's uh, inspired by the preparatory conversation that we had for this uh, webinar, wanted to remind ourselves uh, of the fact that the rise of the agricultural, of the agri-industrial plantation um, in, in the 16th or from the 16th century was actually enabled by massive migrations, forced migration, and the subsequent exploitation of an estimated 11 million enslaved people from the African uh, continent and the way in which they achieved agricultural productivity and efficiency uh, was largely not through technological innovation, but through sort of that labor supply at very low costs, repetitiveness of their tasks and a very strict, violent uh, supervision. And people were looking at agri-food chains today in the global north and south remind us that the way in which uh, these contemporary agri-food chains are organized uh, actually steeped in the histories of the colonial uh, plantation. Whereas that 
is not what I focus on in our empirical research. I think it's important to make that linkage and maybe we can uh, come back to the link um, in the discussion. But looking at the case of a Dutch horticulture, um, in the case of the Netherlands, the agri-food chain uh, here, it is often pointed out that the high degree of technological innovation is actually one of the reasons why the Netherlands, Netherlands is topping the list of agricultural uh, exporters, with the highest earnings uh, being made in the subsector of horticulture largely the exports of, of flowers and vegetables. But the underbelly of that is actually that uh, horticulture is also the most labor intensive subsector of agriculture here in the, in the Netherlands. With the majority of the workers since sort of the, the past 15 years or so stemming from Central and Eastern Europe since the uh, EU enlargement since uh, 2004. Um, agriculture is actually the sector which employs the largest share of the estimated uh, 350,000 migrants from Central and Eastern Europe. Mm. Um, the flip side of these migrants from uh, Central and Eastern European countries, um, also the, the, the insecurity of these migrants is actually the flip side of the high um, productivity and the export successes of Dutch horticulture. Uh, their conditions are characterized by precarity in, in different ways. On the one hand, um, they're usually employed through indirect um, contracts with uh, employment agencies. Uh, they have a very high employment insecurity, often uh, through a zero, con zero hour contract, which means they don't know exactly sort of how many hours they're going to work throughout the, the week, what their earnings will be at the end of the month. Will that be sufficient to, to pay the, the bills? The wages are low. And, and that's a very important point, their dependency on employers is very high. And that's because of the uh, interlinked contracts, uh, sort of they do not only get uh, an employment contract from the work agency, but also accommodation or usually also accommodation contracts, health insurance is also provided, often transport as well, which on the one hand is a beneficial uh, package, but it also means there's a high degree of dependency. And I'll, I'll try to flag that uh, later, which also means they can be, it weakens their bargaining power uh, in relation uh, to their employer. Now in that setting, um, with our study, we asked, how do technological innovations in Dutch horticulture relate to migrant workers' employment, sort of the quantitative uh, employment and the working conditions, sort of more qualitative aspects of their work? And we look at this question from a three-dimensional framework that brings together employment on the one hand, sort of that more quantitative <clears throat> Uh, dimension, then the, the precarity or security of the work on the other hand, and lastly, different dimensions of technological innovation. So if we, we have the employment um, dimension um, and, and um, start from, from the idea that Keynes developed of technological unemployment uh, is basically unemployment that is caused through uh, economizing the, the means of employing uh, labor. So the question is whether technological advancement actually leads to such unemployment or there might be a, an employment generation through new technologies. Uh, secondly, uh, we look at qualitative aspects of work. Um, on the one hand, uh, wondering whether a greater insecurity of income, of employment, um, of working conditions more broadly are observed, or whether technological innovations and changes are actually or may be associated with improvements in the, in the security uh, of those conditions. And um, amongst different te technological changes, we take up a distinction that the early value chain literature has made between different forms of 
uh, so-called upgrading in global value chains. And we zoom in on, on two of those. There are others, namely product versus progress uh, process upgrading. Product upgrading is uh, basically the move into higher value added products and process upgrading is forms of uh, technological change that that change the uh, the production process, which of course may be intertwined with changes in the product that results from such uh, changes. So that's basically the framework in a nutshell. And uh, we we came up uh, with the following key findings based on a study, an exploratory study using semi-structured qualitative interviews. Uh, with a range of different actors, but many of them uh, were somehow related to the, the labor movement or let's say the Dutch uh, existing context in the Dutch labor movement were often um, a sort of seeds or gatekeepers for, uh, for further contexts. So uh, we have quite a number of, we interviewed quite a number of uh, trade unionists, uh, workers, migrant workers, but also people in uh, sort of uh, from sort of the employer side, um, labor advisors, uh, researchers. So that's, but as I said, it's an exploratory uh, a study. And uh, as I'll point out later, sort of some of the patterns we identify, which, which I've summarized on this slide, are actually things that um, follow up research would need to corroborate. Now, what, what I try to express um, uh, on this slide uh, is how these three dimensions, um, sort of, of precarity, employment, unemployment, and different forms of technological innovation intersect and what types of results they uh, produce. Um, and I'll start with the most positive uh, potential effect of technological innovation, which is expressed or exemplified in a quote in that blue quadrant uh, by a researcher from Tilburg University. The people who work in the cultivation of new paprika varieties are employed directly. They no longer depend on the employment agency, highlighting that in terms of employment security, there can be um, improvements uh, in case of uh, moves towards product upgrading. And here they refer to uh, new varieties, which may enable higher margins uh, for, the, for the growers, which also enable the, the growers to directly employ uh, workers, providing more employment stability and possibly also other uh, improvements. Apart from what is signaled here, namely that assumption or maybe hope uh, of, of uh, greater security, there are also indications that product innovation can also generate a new employment because uh, sort of product innovation requires more specific skills, um, thus widening the, the pool of required labor. So both in terms of employment generation and security of work, um, there's an, an assumption or, or sort of a horizon of a win-win um, for migrant workers. And moving towards the opposite uh, case, the, the most bleak scenario and maybe the most common scenario that we perceive is the one that combines um, uh, that basically results from uh, processes of automation, which it seems in horticulture have reached some degree of uh, of sealing. Um, um, and the the quote here: uh, the conveyor belt always goes up in speed; they never slow down. There's no way that you can complain about this if you can't keep up. Can return to Poland. That's what we are told. It's actually taken from earlier study uh, by McGoran and, and others, but it reflects some of the, um, the findings in our study, which highlights that on the one hand, um, automation or process uh, upgrading leads to increases the work pressure and leads, um, leads migrant workers in Dutch horticulture actually to compete uh, with machine. And as a result of that, 
also weakens their bargaining power. Uh, basically, there's a, a threat of dismissal, which is sort of the most extreme form of labor uh, flexibilization, which is also flanked not just by a, a Dutch legislation, which allows for a number of these very flexible employment relations that are common in um, horticulture, but also European uh, regulation. Um, so this is uh, a case where um, technological unemployment through automation that we see in um, in different ways in different subsectors, but sort of extreme uh, in some cases where, for example, um, respondents were talking about orchid um, cultivation, where you basically have one person managing the whole process of producing producing. Um, millions of um, of orchids um, and combined with a high degree of insecurity of employment of income but also in terms of the work the worker representation in their relationship with the the employer the thirdly there's a more ambiguous case also of progress uh, process upgrading uh, but through a different way namely the the extension of the cultivation period, and that can take different forms. The greenhouse is the most obvious uh, case where moves from open field agriculture to the greenhouse means that cultivation can take place through a longer theory, um, uh, sort of period of time, uh, sometimes even year round. Um, and that has uh, advantages in terms of employment generation, more people or more labor is obviously required. But on the other hand, it's not clear whether it's all the same workers who are benefiting from that extended uh, period. But in terms of employment security, also one can expect that this has positive effects. But on the other hand, and that's um, highlighted here in the, the quote, uh, there are also uh, insecurities associated with it. And what is highlighted in the quote is that the work in the greenhouse is very difficult, it's very harsh climatic uh, uh, conditions that workers have to, uh, to endure. There are other examples of extension of the cultivation uh, period, but I'm not going to go into that in the interest of time. So flagging or summarizing these patterns that we uh, observe, what um, what do we conclude? <clears throat> On the one hand, um, we hope that these fresh empirical perspectives, exploratory, but yet, but also the conceptual innovation of of this uh, three dimensional conceptual framework, help us to um, understand the complex triangle between food technology and migration in a deeper way against the very pressing crisis of yeah, food security on the one hand, uh, xenophobic backlashes and uh, what has been called the fourth industrial revolution of digitalization, automation, other forms of um, technological advances. And to recap these two uh, broad patterns uh, that we perceive is on the one hand, that process upgrading that seeks to make people work like machines um, results both in technological unemployment and at the same time and interconnected with it heightens uh, migrant workers insecurities. Whereas on the other hand, there is sort of that horizon of product innovations may offer uh, sort of the, the financial space for, for growers that can translate into greater uh, securities, better working conditions and seem already now to increase labor demand. But the question, and I didn't mention that before, is whether that benefits migrant workers or whether in a dual labor market sort of segmented by citizenship slash immigration status, whether migrant workers are the ones benefiting from it. As I said, this exploratory, we need more research to, to corroborate these patterns. But what we can say now already, I think is in order to address the, it's not risk, the insecurities, the grave insecurities that we see for a huge workforce just in the Netherlands, but similar patterns are likely to, to be there 
uh, in other parts of Europe and other parts of the, the world. In order to address those, I think two steps are required. One is to deal with the oligopolistic food system in which retailers in particular sort of exert a very high pressure on, on uh, smaller actors or less powerful actors in the, in the food system. And secondly, sort of to end the treatment of migrant workers as a second class citizen as two steps to both achieve or move towards uh, migrant justice and food justice. So thank, thank you, you very much. much. And um, I look thank forward you so to much. discussing this with Karen. you. Yeah, we, we are a little out of time already. So I just hand over to Giorgio Perina, please. Thank you so much, Karen. Giorgio? Yeah, sorry. Yeah, was, uh, excuse yeah. me. No, no, yeah, sorry. Okay, thank you for this opportunity to share some thoughts and uh, thanks to Karim for uh, the very inspiring presentation. It was, it was very, very interesting. So uh, now I'm try I will try to speak about uh, uh, the context of Bologna, the so-called city of food in Bologna. It is uh, uh, a, a, very a very peculiar way to look at the uh, food supply chain, uh, the, I think uh, the working condition in the food supply chain, and uh, I will focus obviously on the uh, very last mile uh, uh, logistic as uh, the food delivery platform food delivery uh, work is called. Uh, so. Mm -hmm. Now you can see, okay, perfect. Uh, yeah, so we, we okay. The city of food represents a very peculiar organization of the food industry, uh, focused on the um, on the organization of a uh, econo uh, urban economic uh, polit a political economy based on the city of food on the as a brand that is uh, looking at the uh, food, the cultural food, the agri-food uh, culture tradition, Italian agri-food culture and tradition as a, as a leverage to position the city in the, the city of Bologna in the global value chain. Uh, it, it is a, a step in the, in the path to position the, the, the Bologna in the global value city of uh, tourism, but also of cultural uh, industry, et cetera. It is uh, an interesting case study because it uh, represents, I think, uh, 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 it is a marketing operation that uh, try to put the local looking at the global, to valor valorize the peculiar characteristic of the city of Bologna. Uh, there is two, I, I will try to, to talk about uh, two cases, very specific case studies. The, the one, it is the, FICO, it is the so-called Fabrica Italiana Contadina, Italy World. It is a, one of the, I think, the main uh, agri-food thematic park in Italy. Uh, the second case, uh, it is the platform food delivery, that is the very last mile logistic uh, related to food supply chains. I will start, uh, uh, to be more concrete, uh, I will start with some um, some uh, local authority point of view. This is a, this is a, a part of an interview that uh, I made. Uh, this is a city councillor of Bologna that explain uh, how it see, he see the, the city of food. It is, city of food means a city that based on a characteristic of Italianness in the collective imagination, that is the quality of food, develop its offer, its economy, and uh, relate in relation to the quality of life. So in the political uh, uh, debate, there is, uh, sorry, there is the, this, imagine, this, uh, this view of the city of food, how, to, how the city of food would be in, uh, in order to achieve some uh, results. Uh, this is uh, a, a, another interview, this is in this case, the assessor, an assessor of, of work of tourism in Bologna say that uh, Bologna must allow you a good quality of life and a good balance between lifetime and professional time. Uh, the city of food uh, has not to be uh, a model that makes the same 
taglieri, that is the uh, taglieri, it is an Italian way to say plate of charcuterie. Uh, you have to focus on the quality of tourism and the quality of restoration of the, of the catering. So there is, there is a social dimension of food. And this aspect, uh, the assessor said, it is uh, a central part, a uh, very pivotal part of the city of food. So it is the, also the possibility to, of recovering food waste and processing. Uh, so FICO, it is, uh, as I said, already said, uh, a very, um, agro food thematic park, it is the so-called Disneyland of the food. And it is a very big facility since it is uh, 100,000 square meters, and uh, inside uh, there is uh, there are seven thematic areas depending on uh, educa uh, educational dimension, uh, the the variety of food, the variety of supply chain of food. The there is a part that, uh, uh, dedicated more to child, another part dedicated to uh, cultural uh, things, etc. Uh, a very interesting point in the let's say in the public debate, and that is that uh, um, the workers are called, uh, are, as, are called as ambassador of the taste, that uh, in, the, uh, in the concrete uh, articulation, in, it is a, a myth because uh, uh, the working condition also in the FICO facilities, in the FICO thematic park, is uh, are very precarious working condition and living condition since uh, it embed the pre-existing uh, degradating servile working condition that are marked the uh, labor market, the Italian labor market since the beginning of the, uh, of the, the 2000s. This is a map of the FICO facilities. As you can see, it is a very big uh, facility with uh, uh, Specific. There is a, an, an infrastructure also. There is also an, uh, an urban infra, a transport infrastructure on dedicated organizations. Since the, there is a, some specific uh, bus line dedicated to the the, the FICO, the FICO uh, Disneyland FICO, and uh, the a, a very big part of the economy of Bologna uh, has been uh, thought related to the development of this uh, um, of this thematic uh, of this agri food thematic part uh, so there is a, a, a very important uh, element of my reasoning and it is, is the following that is city of food the infrastructure in process the city of food it is an historical infrastructure infrastructure in process it is not just a technical infrastructure but it is a a social, political, uh, social technical, uh, social material infrastructure meets digital platform food delivery in a in a in a, in a long standing process of terrorization of economy since uh, the from manufacturing manufacturing represent uh, again uh, yet uh, a very important part of the economic sector in Bologna, but. Uh, in the last 20 years, there was a, a very um, significant uh, tertiarization uh, dedicated to tourism, uh, catering, hospitality sector, etc., with a pro proliferation of precarious survival and uh, poor working condition uh, with, uh, uh, con uh, with labor contracts such as uh, is very similar to zero hour contract. That, or uh, in Italy it's called uh, uh, lavoro a chiamata, uh, with, without any kind of uh, uh, stability, any kind of social protection, uh, uh, without uh, uh, a guaranteed uh, amount of working hour. Uh, and this is part of an infrastructuring of, uh, of the urban political economy based on a low added value economy that meets, in this case, with the digital platform food delivery as very last mile food, uh, food logistic. Um, so from a, an idea, because a very a pillar of the brand of the city of food brand, it is the sustainability of food supply chain from uh, the, the, the upstream to the downstream. But in the, in fact, in the concrete articulation, we 
uh, we see the proliferation of uh, a degradation of labor uh, of service kind of, uh, of work too. This, uh, this is the uh, the main photo, the main uh, uh, element that are emerged in this uh, in this kind of uh, organization organization of political economy. This is uh, uh, um, an image of uh, of global workers in the in this case to uh, of global workers in Bologna, and uh, this is, this interview is in. Uh, trade unionist of the one of the three main uh, union in Italy. Uh, they say that uh, the development of tourism uh, created uh, uh, sorry, uh, the so-called Città dei Italieri, no? Città, uh, the, the city of plate of charcuterie, uh, the, uh, namely an enormous development of from related to food. Uh, in the historical center, so there is like a standardization of the of, of the service related to food. There is like a, a standardization, a infrastructurization of the uh, kind of work, precarious kind of work, uh, with a uh, very low added value working condition. And the unionists say that the digital economy is entered in this kind of context. So there is a. Uh, an important, very important element that there is a continuity between the, pre the, pre the previous precarious working condition, the previous uh, uh, strategy of political urban economy and the digital platform economy. It, this means that the digital platform economy embed, no, do not create new kind of uh, exploitation or work exploitation, but embedded the pre-existing one. So it is an interesting point uh, where city of food uh, infrastructure in process meets uh, the, the new uh, the new kind of te digital technologies, in this case, the digital platform technologies. So uh, to just to conclude the final remarks, uh, it is that uh, digital technologies, in this case, the food delivery has not been intended as something neutral, as something that creates the new condition of exploitation, but instead, uh, uh, put a dialogue with the pre existing normative, with the pre existing infrastructure in process, with the pre existing working condition that mark the city of food, the uh, catering sector, the tourism sector, etc. In some cases, uh, uh, strengthening this exploitation condition, this uh, uh, precarious and degradating condition. Uh, it is a very, a very interesting point of reflection. It is the economic and social upgrade that in the concrete concrete articulation it is a economic versus social upgrade since it's true that there is some um, some uh, yeah i'm going to finish there is some uh, economic actor that uh, it, it is the tension between the private interest and the public value in the infrastructurization of the city of food, there was the, uh, a huge uh, amount of private interest against the uh, production of, of public value. And so there is the need to uh, a holistic comprehension of food, sustain food sustainability from the upstream to down the downstream that uh, comprehend, that uh, analyze the, the entire sustainability, not just uh, the sustainability of, of supply chain, but also the sustainability of uh, uh, food, the working condition, et cetera. So thanks okay. and uh, Thank sorry for you. the- I don't want to be rude, but we are running no. out of time. And so thank you so much. Yeah, we're speaking about standardization and uh, forms of organization. And I want to hand over to Mr. Osterwechel, and he's speaking about food security and post-harvest inter interventions in food systems. Please go ahead. Thank yeah. you for being yeah. with us. Um, can you hear me and see my presentation? Very good, yeah. Okay. You can um, go on the full screen if you like with the presentation. Okay, I think I need this one yeah. 
Um, I will talk about, um, we talk about food systems and, and supply chains. Uh, I, I like to, to explain a little bit about this. The food system is, is uh, basically um, system thinking, whereas a value chain is, is linear thinking. Um, and this, has a, this is, for example, a, a food system. In the center, you see a, a value chain. It starts at, at, at seed, in, all kind of inputs, and something is being produced, and it ends up at the consumer. But there's all kind of uh, other sectors involved in this as well. Um, if we look at, um, at value chains uh, and food systems, it's important to realize that there is, there is a very different approach of looking at them. So, so a value chain or a uh, supply chain is basically the same. Um, basically, the, the, the decision maker in a value chain is a, a businessman or a businesswoman, somebody who wants to make profit. That's, that's what it comes down to it. Whereas a uh, food system that's being looked at from, the, from a ministry or, or, or an NGO. So a ministry, for example, wants to achieve something. Could be feeding the cities, food security, uh, loss reduction, energy efficiency, job creation, anything. However, if they want to achieve this, they are, these basically are, are, are um, food system uh, approaches or food system goals. Now, if you want to achieve these things, it is basically the, the value chains within the food system that need to do it. Now, if you want to achieve something, you have to make sure from a food system perspective that the decision maker at value chain level can make a profit. That's what it comes down to. That you can do by various things. You can do it by import quota. You can do it by subsidies. You can do it by, um, by, by regulating price. You can do anything. But basically, you, you influence the, the outcome of the business plan for the decision maker in the, in the value chain, basically the, the, the company that makes the decision. So that's, I think that's, that's important to understand. Um, so implementing food systems, uh, let, let's say the, the arrow, the, 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 the big one, the gray one, is a value chain. Now, it is being influenced by many people. It's being influenced by consumers, but the consumers are being influenced by pressure groups, by, by, by anybody. Uh, so the consumers basically influence the retailer. The retailer uh, influences the, the export and so on. Um, now at primary production level, uh, government has a possibility to influence also the, the, the systems and also all kind of financing groups like World Bank or, or fi international financers. What they do if they uh, finance agricultural projects, they as a prerequisite to, to obtaining a finance, they demand a uh, um, social and environmental impact assessment, for example. And in this way, they already influence uh, the, the primary production. So what I try to explain here is that you have a value chain and there is all kinds of influences from all sides. Now, if you want to achieve something, you have to understand this picture, like who is influencing who, and um, by what means could I influence uh, at what part of the value chain to achieve my objectives? Um, now, if we talk about resilience, uh, um, main uh, contributor to the resilience, everybody talks about resilience of food chains. Um, I think it's, it's less dependency on a limited number of foreign supply chains. Now we have globalization and what does it lead to that, that people buy, especially in, in developing countries, they buy uh, staples uh, where they can get them the cheapest. 
So they get a lot of staples, grains from, from India, grains from, from Ukraine, Russia, but they depend on it a lot. Uh, and local production is a big, is lagging behind because of this competition. Um, we think that resilience could be strengthened by strengthening local supply chains. Um, stimulation specifically also of small and medium enterprises. I will come to that in the next slide. Um, and through technology that matches the size of operation and economically uh, justify this. What we see a lot is that investments are being made, for example, in, in cold storage facilities because international institutions think that, you know, once you cool a perishable product, you have less waste. However, if, if these products are for a local market and it's not economically justified to use this cold storage, they end up not being used. So lots of money is wasted. Hundreds of millions are wasted there. And there's other means you can, you can for example, a tomato for, for a local market or a regional market, you could simply harvest it three days earlier and have it ripen on the way uh, while treating it well through standard operating procedures. But anyway, you, you need to um, adapt the, the uh, technology to the level uh, that can be economically justified. Otherwise, it will simply stop. This is, let's say, two figures. If you look at, at the, the developed world, you see the, the, the left uh, graph. There is some small companies the, the, the bulk of the production and, and the national um, the, uh, the, the, let's say the, gen, the, the, the GNP comes from uh, small and medium-sized companies. And there is a few large international companies. If you look at uh, developing countries, this goes for all kinds of companies, but also for farming companies, you see millions of, of smallholders and you see hardly any small and medium-sized enter uh, enterprises, and you see just a few very big ones like Chiquita or Dole, but the missing middle, it's not there. Um, and we think that, that especially you, there's demographic uh, developments that there is population growth, there is also urbanization, and if you take the two together, in 10 years there is many people in the city and less people in, in rural areas, and who's going to feed them? Not the small ones. They should, they should, you know, we shouldn't bother them and help them. But if you really want to develop food supplies in developing countries, you need to do something for the small and medium-sized enterprises. And if you want to do that, you need to develop technologies that match their needs. So we don't have to go for the, the high tech, uh, but we can also go into mid-tech solutions. This is a picture that shows that, you know, there is uh, for home consumption, some subsistence farmers, they produce for home consumption. Um, small intermediate farming systems, they produce for rural urban market and so on. And, and the modern agricultural enterprises, they basically can produce for, for export. Now, uh, it's very difficult that there is some cases of, of, uh, of farmers produce in an organized way for export. But basically, it is this line where uh, the, the um, technology needs to match the type of farmer and the type of market. Um, and then one thing is very important in, in, in perishables um, is the need for cooling, the cooling infrastructure. And I just made a remark on it. People invest sometimes in, in very uh, sophisticated and especially very expensive cooling infrastructure. Well, it costs a lot in terms of investment. It costs a lot in terms of emissions. It, terms, it costs a lot in terms of, of energy. Uh, and it's okay, but we very much need to look at uh, products market combinations to, to justify the need for uh, cooling and to justify it also the, 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 the moment in the value chain where you need to start cooling. As an example, strawberries for an export market, you need to cool within 20 minutes. Uh, 
that needs means also that you need the infrastructure in small size infrastructure near the farm and you need a closed cold chain in transport to the export market if one thing is missing your project will fail now if you have a mango we do mangoes from haiti to the united states we we take them from the inlands and we have at least 24 hours before we start cooling them so we treat them well get them in 24 hours uh, at the cold storage but it means that we need the cold storage in a larger capacity but in the in this in the port for export so that's a completely different investment and it's important to understand in cooling because um, millions maybe billions of, of of money is being wasted there by just thinking like once you cool something it's okay but it needs to be economically justified and that's um, my my contribution Thank you. Thank you so much, René. This is a completely new aspect, aspects, the midterm solutions we heard about and the missing middle. And I'm curious how Tesselje is commenting on these different <laughs> facets of the food sector. Thank you so much, René. Thank you very much, uh, Felicitas, for, for the introduction and to the speakers for this rather challenging thing to wrap this up in, in about five minutes to even leave you maybe for some questions. So do put them in the chat if you have questions. If I think if we don't have time, then, then the speakers can, can respond to you outside of the, uh, the webinar. Now, when we talk about the food supply chain, and uh, I think in the presentations, we saw different stages of the food supply chain. Um, and Rene, thank you very much for clarifying again, the difference between the food supply chain and um, uh, the food system at play. Uh, but there's agriculture, there's food processing, transportation, there's the hospitality, the restaurant business, the delivery services, and actually also domestic work is added to the typical um, a line of, of, of work in, in this chain where people clean up after us, after we had dinner or prepare our food uh, in case um, we don't have the time or, or capacity to do so. So this is a big, big chain and it's all about food. And we all know, as the speakers have elaborated, that migrant workers uh, form an essential part of of pro producing um, uh, the food in this chain. And as both um, um, from, from the Netherlands and Italy speakers, Giorgio and Karen um, uh, elaborated, when migrant workers are involved in this labor, uh, it's precarious labor, often zero hour contracts have been mentioned and um, uh, quite some, some insecurity there. Um, and as René brings forward, if we strive for resilience, sustainability, then the big question is how, how do we match this insecurity and this sometimes abusive labor relation with this target of sustainability and resilience, etc. cetera. Um, now, in the introduction of this webinar, um, Felicitas and I presented a little example of the shrimps. First, migrant workers came to the Netherlands to peel the shrimps. Then we shipped the shrimps to Morocco to be peeled there. And now we have a machine to peel them. So no migration of the shrimps or people involved. And if we don't have a machine, we have local people who might actually be migrant workers involved in the peeling. But this local produce appeals to part of the, the consumer group who want the local produce and produce with a low um, uh, climate footprint. So, so you see actually two directions going here, but um, um, it's costly. So price comes to the fore um, uh, also as a way, as, as what defines choices to automate, to do it on a local level, but more costly. Um, and um, um, I'm just shifting through my notes. I, I actually, in preparation of my contribution, I had I had these little tomatoes ready for you to look at because I don't have slides, so I, I do it with props. Um, what I think is very important, and you might wonder why is somebody who's a professor in migration law presenting this, is that we look at 
the um, uh, regulatory infrastructure at play and migration law and social policy, which are my domains, are part of this bigger regulatory infrastructure that is relevant. But it is, Rene mentioned import quotas, subsidies, price policies. Um, I would add public procurement. Where does a government buy their vegetables and fruits for the canteen? Do they offer meat still at a government uh, canteen? Yes or no? Um, all those legislative bits are part of what I see as my field of studying migration law and the impact of law and the way we produce food and the way we do automate it or not um, um, uh, the food production system. And just on a final note, uh, Felicitas, if I may, to give an example that I think sort of wraps up the three uh, talks um, is these tomatoes that I've just shown. Um, the Netherlands, we, we're in the stage of de deciding whether they should be tax free so that people eat more vegetables and fruits. And then a retail said, yes, but what about the, the vegetables wrapped in um, uh, plastics? Um, are they also um, to be cheaper? Um, they are wrapped in plastics in, in cool environments, often by labor migrants in precarious working conditions. Do we need cooled tomatoes? I think, Renee, you, you, you very uh, clearly elaborate. Maybe we don't. If you treat the tomatoes well, you can, you can take out the cooling cell. You can take out the migrant labor in a precarious situation. You can take out the plastics and just eat and enjoy a fresh tomato when it's tomato season, maybe even. So that's, that's another big step we might be facing. And um, thank you very much from my side uh, to uh, Felicitas for organizing and the three speakers for, for their thought provoking. And I think the holistic approach that also Giorgio mentioned is the way we need to continue. So I really enjoyed this exchange across disciplines and I hope we can continue along this interdisciplinary um, investigation of the, of the topic at hand. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tesseltje. I enjoyed all the speak all the all the speakers, all the presentations.